Hello, 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 good people, citizens of the world. Welcome to Climate Speaks 2020. I'm your host, Darian Deshaun. We are so happy to have you. We know you could have been anywhere in the world, but you were here with us tonight, and we appreciate it. First off, we hope that you are safe, and we hope that you are healthy. Because tonight we are here to listen and to support our young leaders of the future. Uh, we have an incredible lineup of, of young rock stars happening both tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, the, this year's Climate Speaks crew consists of poets, essayists, and short story writers. So that's what we have in store. And tonight is really a platform for us to step back and to hear their words, hear their voices, so that we can collectively move together as a people. All right. But this is not going to be a passive experience. No, 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 no. It is going to be interactive. And I'm going to show you how this is going to work. So because we are in this virtual space, we are on this virtual stage because we can't hear each other applause. We show applause in another way. And so two ways, actually, the first way is my personal favorite, which is raising the roof. So we are going to show you how that's done. So everybody in my virtual studio audience, raise the roof. Everybody raise the roof, 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 raise the roof. That's raise the roof. All right. And our second way, second way of showing applause is through spirit fingers. So let's try that everybody. Spirit fingers, spirit fingers, spirit fingers, spirit fingers, spirit fingers. And we do that because it feels good to collectively move together as a unit, right? Because there is power in that and there is power in collective action collective action which is the name of the game which we will mention at the end of the show but we'll put a pin on that but my job as host is to make sure that we are staying active the next thing that we're going to be doing in order to keep you guys active is making sure that you guys are typing away in the chat that's right throughout the show we want to hear you guys we want to see you guys typing away in the chat um in real time and there are a couple of different phrases if you're like new to chatting you're like ah, i don't know what to type so we're going to give you a couple of things that you could add the first one is the word nice so that's spelled n i i i i i i i i i i i i c e make sure that you have a minimum of five eyes that's very important uh, another phrase that you could throw at us is say word right it's pretty self-explanatory and then the final one is speak on it so climate speaks speak on it you get the idea the other thing is if there is a line that is really jumping out at you that you hear from our speakers type it in the chat okay that lets us know if it's resonating with you that lets us know that you're the speaker lets the speakers know that you are hearing them that you are really paying attention and lastly feel free to respond to other people in the chat that way we are having a public discourse we are having a group discussion as a virtual community all right so with all that being said i want to hand it off to the director of the climate museum this is the first one guys here we go everybody please raise the roof and give it up for miranda massey greetings one and all welcome again to the climate museum and to climate speaks 2020 we are so happy to be here with all of you tonight thank you for joining us the mission of the Climate Museum is to inspire action on the climate crisis, the huge, multidimensional, existential climate crisis that we face with programming across the arts and sciences. And our focus is on deepening all of our understanding, our shared understanding, on building connections and a sense of community, and on advancing just solutions, solutions that manifest justice. That leads us to have a special focus on both the arts and youth. Why the arts? Because the arts are a mirror in which we can see the incredibly powerful emotions, most of them not positive, that we all experience about the climate crisis when we start to embrace the reality of it. The arts let us know that we're not alone, that we're seen and we're heard, and that we're all going through this together. Why I focus on youth? Because this is profoundly an intergenerational justice question. The climate crisis is a crisis that is, to be blunt, 
being visited upon younger people by older people. And every minute of delay hurts younger people more. So quite naturally, younger people have stepped forward to be our leaders. And in the last two years, we've seen a wave of youth engagement with the climate crisis that has quite literally, as well as metaphorically, changed the terms of the debate. And our fantastic performers tonight are part of that wave of youth action. So that's why arts, that's why youth, that's why youth arts, and that's why climate speaks. It's our second year doing this program. Last year, we did it the, from the stage of the Apollo Theater. Um, and that gives me a great pivot point to the next thing I wanna say, which is intimidating as that stage was, that storied, hallowed stage with its vastness and the hundreds of people you could see from the stage in the seats, to do this is much harder. To try to make a connection through these screens is much harder and it requires a deeper kind of courage and grit. And the young people you're gonna hear from tonight had the rug completely pulled out from under them by the coronavirus crisis. And I'm just talking in terms of this program. Of course, they and the rest of us had that happen in the rest of our lives as well. They started off doing one kind of programming, program, excuse me, and then it turned into this. All of them stuck with it. They worked through all the barriers associated with this, and they have demonstrated a true, true grit that is what we all need to get it through the climate crisis together and to move forward as one people, like Darian said, in addressing the multitude of challenges that we face. This is a time of profound promise with the mobilization for black lives, raising the prospect of true social transformation, but it is also an unbelievably difficult time and especially an unbelievably difficult time to be a young person. Um, so I wanna, I wanna ask for some spirit fingers for our young people who have stuck with this program and now tell you about what you're about to see, which is a beautiful video in which these students express their sadness and fury about the climate crisis. Their arc in this program has been to speak on those emotions with clarity and truth and to take action together. And we're gonna be asking you to walk that same path and to be on that same arc of taking your emotions about the climate crisis and turning them into civic action that can change the world. With that, I'm going to ask our event producers to show you this beautiful video made by Momentist. Home is a place of soil, of leaves and bark and branches. In our eyes, we noticed the fish whose lips touched death. I woke up a second time, and when I did, it was almost like my room had been plastered with white paint. I don't know how to start my life when my end has already been written. We deserve to have only matters. The earth gets what it needs to survive. All they have to do is act. We must spread awareness among the youth of today with the goal of assuaging mother's anger. If you say you don't miss her dancing, you are lying. I should have known that you will always be deaf to what you don't want to hear. I can't believe the denial has erased where my home base is. I'm faceless. Did we take the wrong path? We can let our stories intermingle. Otherwise, I will be the beans to your end. Lest angry tides crash onto one more wasted day. Coming routinely to return the waste from whence they came from. No longer do they want to be burdened by letting you in with open arms. We have a choice to save Mother Nature or face the wrath.
That is what's up. Everybody, spirit fingers for that beautiful kind of prologue to our show. All right. So, people, I think we are ready. I think we are ready to do this. So we're just going to take a look at our crew for tonight. Oh, kind of. This is our Justice League for tonight. Tomorrow we have the Avengers. So this is our whole crew, our whole lineup for uh, for tonight. So we're going to get this started. We're going to get this party started right. We're going to get this party started quickly. So we all know that it is very, very difficult to go first. So it is important and it is imperative that we show our first speaker a tremendous amount of love. All right. So here we go. You guys ready? Here we go. Please, everybody, raise the roof. Raise the roof and give it up for Brianna. Hi, I'm Brianna. Um, my piece is called Means to Your End. Imagine the Statue of Liberty being submerged underwater. Imagine Nemo's and Dory swimming through your local bodegas. Imagine your precious apartment being the habitat for a giant octopus. New York City has become the city of Atlantis, a city that we will never see again because you let climate change get the best of you. Your city has been sunken. We won't see the children laughing or the homeless napping, the old men playing dominoes or the racket of their radios. We won't see the cars honking or the people walking or the streets just roaring because now they are mourning. Because too many lost their lives, homes, and belongings because of the constant falling of your society, of our world. The poor were too late to get out since they were left to be washed out, while the rich to escape since it looks like you can't be replaced. But the little boys and girls who died were able to be misplaced, escaped like the black men you harshly imprisoned, keeping them into a cycle of imprisonment. All you do is harm each other instead of listen. But you have to be so ignorant that even shouting in your ear won't change your apathy. And because all you want to hear are my screams when you chop me down and get those useless dollar signs out of my frown. And we, we are left to see the dead bodies caught about stuck under the ceilings of their own home. Why must you put those nasty fumes in my air? Why must you spit and degrade them for protecting me? Why must you be power-hungry monsters just to get those useless dollar signs out of me? Why must you? Have I taught you nothing? Why must you drill straight through my heart? I am from America to Africa to Antarctica to Australia. I am from the Pacific to the Atlantic to the Arctic Ocean to the Indian Sea. I am eyes because I can see everything that crawls on me. I am skin because I can feel everything that crawls on me. I am eyes because I can see everything you've done to me. I am the sadness, the joy, and the fear. I am your silent killer that you choose to ignore. While I am thriving, you are diminishing, letting your people die in numbers, only caring about yourself and no one else. That's not how you should act. I will stay here longer than you will, but you still don't respect me. Instead, you spit and degrade me knowing damn well you need me to breathe. Why should I keep up with your idiocy when all you do is harm me? All you do is destroy me, yet you don't understand how powerful I am. I am the symbol of growth. I am those weeds that go in between your cracks. I can break you apart or I can put you together, but you need me. Why is it you used to worship me and now step on me like a child having a tantrum? I may be your mother, but I didn't birth your ignorance. You never followed in my footsteps, so you choose to ignore my warnings, knowing I can explode and obliviate you in a heartbeat. You never replace me. You never help your mother after a fall. You act like an incorrigible child, never listening to their mother, always going through one ear and out the other. If only you listened to them. If only you followed in their footsteps. They replant me. They protect me. They listen to me. They tried their best to stop you. Why? I am always living. You decided to cut me down, yet you never realized you can never kill me. I, am all, I will always come back while you will become extinct. I am the one who runs this show of your existence. I am here as a wake-up call, because I am your only savior in this mess. I am not one to keep grudges, so all you must do is harness. All you must do is realize that I am here to help. All you must do is open your eyes and ears to the truth that I, the Mother Earth, is here to save you. Otherwise, I will be the means to your end. Oh, that's how we do it. Everybody, 
fan yourself, fan yourself, fan yourself, fan yourself. Everybody fan yourself, fan yourself, fan yourself. And raise the roof, raise the roof for that poem. Yes, yes. Ah, that was so great. Right off the bat, boom, that's how we do it. So check it. All you must do is open your eyes and ears to the truth. That's what's up. Say word. Spirit fingers one more time for Brianna. And keep those fingers wiggling as we give it up for Andreas. Hello, my name is Andreas. And this is an excerpt of a short story I wrote called Second Sun. I woke up to the sunrise today. Well, twice, actually. Well, two different sunrises from two different suns. It's kind of difficult to put into words. For starters, I'm not usually a morning person, which is why when confronted with that dull glow of sunlight creeping through my window at 6.30 a.m., I turned facing the wall and probably fell back asleep. It was a Monday after all. Then I woke up a second time. And when I did, it was like my room had been plastered with white paint. I rolled out of bed and pulled the blinds. In a sea of blue sky, directly on either side of the Empire State Building, sat two identical suns, perched like a waiting gaze. I rubbed my eyes, but the suns remained. And by that time, I wasn't really thinking about going back to sleep, so I glided into my living room and turned on the morning news. For those of you tuning in, my name is Chris Chow, and welcome back to The Daily Chow. The headline under Chris Chow's heavily Botox expression read, Two Suns in Tucson. You heard it here first, people. There are now two suns in the sky. I know what you were thinking. What? How? Why? When? Who? We turn to our resident climate scientist, Dr. Simon, MD, to quell, your, uh, to quell our concerns. I hate to break it to you guys, but Dr. Simon looked nothing like a doctor. Sure, he had glasses, which I guess was a good indicator, but they sat directly above a row of braces and a, bl a, badly, a, a badly ironed flannel shirt. He looked right around 18 years old. Well, Chris, Dr. Simon began, pushing up his glasses towards his eyes. What you said was right on the money. There are now two suns in the sky, as opposed to simply one. But what does this mean for the American public? Well, Chris, obviously, we had one sun, and now we have two. That's roughly a 100% increase in sun. Trust us, we did our math. One can reasonably infer that the sun's effects would only double. Chris Chow feigned shock, but with his heavily Botox expression, you couldn't really tell the difference. So what do you suggest the American people do right now? Well, Chris, it's obvious, isn't it? You just double everything else. Sunscreen, put twice as much on. Sunglasses, two pairs. It makes nothing but perfect sense, Chris. Thank you, Dr. Simon, for your criticism. And I have to stop you right there. The president has just declared war on the sun. We'll get you that footage real quick. I shut off the television. Initially, I stayed on the couch and wondered if this astronomical disturbance was enough to call in sick to work but it wouldn't kill me just to show up anyways. I followed my routine. I buttoned my button-down shirt, put on my tie, put on my slacks, grabbed my bag and my two pairs of sunglasses, and headed out the door. It was hot. Bright, too. The first thing I realized as I exited my apartment was the absence of any sort of shadow. Usually on a particularly hot day, you could seek refuge under bus stops or under awnings. Whatever shadow one sun created, the other erased. And the street was packed with bodies. It seemed like the entire city didn't stop moving. Those in suits, umbrella in one hand and briefcase in the other, waited on the curb, panting for taxis to escape the heat. Mothers and day women chased after their energetic kids on the way to school. I pushed my sunglasses up and then joined the, and, and then joined the channel of commuters leading underground to the subway station. The heat only grew in intensity as I got into the train platform. Everybody shed themselves free of their extra layers, even though the sweat continued to slick down their faces. I pulled out my phone and passed the time scrolling through the headlines. The media came up with a name for the phenomenon, the second sun. There is an immediate and utter shortage of sunscreen, umbrellas, and hats of all shapes and sizes across the globe. Scientists posit rapid evaporation would lead us down a road of constant civilization threatening torrential downpours. The ozone layer is a goner, obviously. Planes in the sky will melt and drop like stones. Climate will be uncertain. Double everything. Double everything. Double the wildfires, double the weather events. You thought that 21% of Australia's, uh, Australia's forests were bad, try 
Expect crises in places you've never seen them before. Forest fires around the corner in Central Park, drugs in the reservoir. The thought unnerved me so badly, I slipped my phone back into my pocket. Before I could even wipe the sweat now streaking down my forehead, the E-train blazed into the station. Chaos ensued when people realized that the train cars were air conditioned. As soon as the door opened, I felt the force of the crowd on my back. I lurched forward and my head made heavy contact with the metal carcass of the E-train. I crumbled on the platform edge. I do not know how long I've been unconscious, but it has felt timeless. I've had countless dreams, visions, whatever you would like to call them. In one of them, a child shows me a painting he had made in class that day. There's a perfectly green field, gray mountains, a blue sky, and two equally yellow suns on either side of the page. In another, I'm on a beach, watching the first sunset and waiting, waiting for the second sunset. It never comes. Life can't always be this way, can it? I hope I wake up soon, though. I have work to get to. Yes, and everybody, we're stirring the pot. Stir the pot, stir the pot, stir it up, 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 and raise the roof for that short story. That's what's up. All right, so let's check out what's going on in the chat room. What are we seeing in the chat room? It looks like I see, uh, what is it, Sunny? Sunny side up, huh? Sunny side up, Andreas. Sunny side up, 726, says spirit fingers for you all. Coco Zhao says, what a strong start. I agree. I mean, just off the bat, boom. Two, our two climate speakers killing it from, from the jump. Uh, Kayla Cruz says, loving it. That's what's up, everybody. Spirit fingers one more time for Andreas. And keep them wiggling as we give it up for Chayonico. My name is Chai Nico, and my piece is named, How Did We Get Here? Let's go back to 1907 in a lab in upstate New York, with the shadows of the sun catching the mid-aged man back from his drowsy state. Leo Beckenland looked to discover that he had made the first non-synthetic plastic, one of the most innovative inventions of the 20th century, and everything that surrounds our society. But did he know he made a monster? 1980. We watched the crashing waves of the sea. We noticed some gears we see. Plastic. Enough you can swim in it. As you dive, plastic bags from gray to white everywhere. And as you swam in plastic bags for, for hours, from the edge of our eyes, we noticed the fish whose lips touched death. As they were floating, with those puppets. We were moving towards the shore when we noticed the black ink surrounding us spreads like a plague. Buzz was heard as the machine collapsed into the sea by a thud. We rushed to see what's going on. And it seems like the skull of the sea is being cracked by the drum. And blood is being drawn. We go upward and see the blood boiled as it seems to try to remove the anger of its owner. The blood is separated into vials and it's in, like ingredients for a potion. The witch takes a vial, the blood turns into nothing disappears without an explanation. It comes back as molecules facing the rage and anger of the earth it melts. The plastic bag is born. That bag is packed like sardines in a box. And then you have it, and it floats away into a drink and into the oceans. But how did this all happen? It's 1941 and the US just entered World War II. And the war progressed, it was costing money to use natural resources. We were wasting them. As to be holden to itself is useful to the war effort. It made up tanks and weapons. It made war possible to win. Leo could not imagine what he had made. He had just made a weapon that could kill thousands of people. Boom, was heard repeatedly, the blood stinking soldier. It was the first mass production of plastic. It put plastic in the mainstream, including bags. Plastic was thought of as an, as an equalizer between people. It is a cheaper material that can be made into goods like wood. People could have what the wealthy were having, but plastic was only a symptom of the deeper issue. We walk the tightrope of time where we can fall off at any moment as we keep making plastic everywhere. 
1979, Iran, fight for us, not us, as chants flooded the streets, passing the empty oil mines. And desperation was felt against the Shah government as it seemed the West was the very government, very godmother of the government and the rich. When it was supposed to be the very godmother of everyone. But the West ignored their screams as cities were shining and beaming with metal, metal bouncing off the sun, but the towns of vast lands stayed the same. So workers were gave, gave up the idea of adoration of the West because they weren't given that, rather a clickly version. So they striped, but the scepter was not held by Iran, by the West. So they placed an embargo on oil and from Iran and people went down under like waves of plastic in the ocean. The equalizer that plastic was, is, is under threat and we walk the right tightrope, we run the tightrope of time. It's 1988 where NASA warned Congress of climate change, causing irreversible damage to the earth and to human life. Plastic, like any supervillain, rose from its disguise and revealed its true intention. Yemen burns. A person wearing pale blue was covered in red, liquid from his heart stripping. A sweat was pouring down the arid belts. People to. The torturous is mice, but it's what happens when it seems like the women of manifest destiny is our morals. When we side with the people that kill just because it gives us power. The equalizer facade was disappearing, but too slow for people to realize in the ticking clock of the tightrope, plastic was taken away across the waves where it was leaving a mark. As it was sent from kings to the thrones to the poor, which swept them literally which caused the cycle of inequality to firm poor to rich. Plastic and its creation added to the unruly monster that is climate change. According to The Guardian, by 2050, plastic could account for 20% of the oil consumption and 15% of the carbon emission, being just one villain out of many, and a cost for human civilization because we will not exist. We'll face Mother Nature's wrath and burn like the bags we burned into the soil. And it will cause the same oceans we fill with plastic to rise and drown us. So stopping it seems simple, right? It protects us and future generations. If we do not at least start somewhere like with plastic bags, then the gases that it produces will be a poison. And the position will make us dance dead by the suffocation of the smell. Plastic is like a drug. It is addicting and it's like a YouTube rabbit hole. You click a video and then you continue to watch an hour. Your day is and you can't stop this your attempts to something else it suffocates the entirety of our world but it's dangerous and if we do not at least start rehab it will cause irreversible damage not only in our oceans and ecosystems but the places we live climate change can never be stopped and people will never get the justice they deserve unless we take a step what you should take from the past is to protect the future start before we drown like yes, 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 yes. And everybody fist in rotation, fist in rotation, fist in rotation, fist in rotation, and raise the roof for that essay. That's what I'm talking about. Check it. Climate change can never be stopped if we don't at least take a step. Spear fingers one more time, everybody, for Chai and Nika, and keep them wiggling as we give it up for Michelle. Michelle. So, my name is Michelle, and my name is Michelle performing If You Are Lying through the perspective of all storyteller. Okay. Oh, uh, um, why don't we go back to the beginning of a story so ancient, so old, Mother Earth cannot even remember it. I won't tell you my name, but just know that I live in a world where nothing exists anymore. Nothing but the ruins of her old body and the sad memory of how life used to be when she danced. In a dark void of intangible colors tainted with footfalls of green, lived this peculiar dot, a galactical celluloid torn at the seams of her five ocean blue dresses. This energy was known as Mother Earth, and she was beautiful. She was this ball of divinity, a mystical entity, home to all that is life. 
When she danced, her dress exploded the colors of heaven and truth. When she danced in this metaphysical world of greedy dreams, the universe was one. But she was also a mother to these insects called the human race, lost in time, lost in space for eternity. These insects live by a nature of misunderstood board games. Life to them was a simple monopoly. They roll the dice to determine their choices and what their voices will say to their brothers and sisters, blaming it on chance rather than taking a stance for what they have done. Always looking for the next big real, they were slowly killing one another and their mother. Obsessions as sharp as glass shards, up their sleeves they pull out cheating cards for they wished to win at this game even if it was against their own mother. They hurt her without any shame, yet still they would claim that they did not know she was their bruised opponent. They did not know her name. Thus the insects created the crime sin in which they swam in for centuries, distracted by its euphoric illusion, its promise of power. But what was sin without consequence? As the hand moved the her criminal children discovered a new way to cope with the comatose state of their mother. Black and since they were a plague, for slowly she started to fade away from the stage. Once they realized that the leaves on her arms were shrinking and the grace in her legs sinking deep down into a place too weak to sustain their sick needs, these insects eventually had to leave her for another planet, a rose gold dot that didn't wear the same blue and green dress she danced in. It was cold as ice to match her hearts. Like the refugees we once accepted, we found refuge in this cold alien world, a temporary comfort to what we've struggled to find and probably never will, unless we go back. Years later, we dropped to our knees, bawling and screaming in despair, begging her to forgive us and refusing to share her own water with her. We don't know if she'll ever love us again. We cannot find them, the society that we want for, and so we must wait. Wait for the longed ones to find us instead, longing for what we once longed for as well, in a time when she was still dancing. So in life, you will encounter people who say, it's just better this way. There's nothing we could live in. The I hope this story has taught you otherwise, that if we don't stop now, with all our harmful ways of living, we won't have anywhere to live anymore. But if we as a people learn to resurrect what once made us human, then maybe we could find a way to sew her beautiful blue and green dress and help her dance again. Ah, yes, she was a beautiful dancer once. Do you remember? If you say you don't miss her dancing, you are lying. Yes, and everybody, we're orchestrating the symphony, orchestrating the symphony, orchestrating the symphony, and we are raising the roof for that piece. Michelle. Check it. If we as a people learn to resurrect what once made us human, that is what's, uh, that is what's up. Speak on it. All right, so let's go and find out what's going on in the chat room again. See what's happening in the chat room. Let's see. Uh, let's see what we got. Six sucks. We have uh, the host is handsome. Who put that down? No, that's not in the chat. That's not in the chat. I made that up. So don't put that in the chat. Put it in the chat. No, I'm kidding. All right. Focus, sorry, bad host. It's about the young people, but seriously, it is about the young people. Uh, Bram Zelser says, imagery so strong. MG 1989 says the emotions still come through. I wholeheartedly agree. I'm here in Harlem and I'm feeling all the emotions. It's beautiful. Maya Brown says, speak on it. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Woo, spirit fingers one more time for Michelle. And I think we are going to rest uh, our speakers, because we have a, we're going to shift gears a little bit because we have a very, 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 very special guest. And I'm going to hand it over to Miranda in order to give our special guest a, a proper, proper introduction. Thank you so much, Darian. And I hate to break it to everybody, but we're not going to get that much of a rest because just now chatting with our very special guest, I learned that they were a slam poetry champion for a number of years. Uh, so get ready for that and get ready for Sloan Leo, who's been a huge supporter of the Climate Museum since our inception, an incredible source of wisdom and uh, emotional uplift uh, and fabulous advice. Sloan had a long and distinguished career as an environmentalist before several years ago, 
recognizing the intersectionality of the climate crisis and other environmental challenges with social justice issues, they turned to design for social innovation. Um, and uh, they're now the director of social innovation for the VADE group, as well as artist in residence at Queer Archive Work. And without further ado, I'm gonna ask for some spirit fingers for Sloan Leo. Here at Fingers from me to everyone else. Also, Miranda and the Climate Museum, let me first just say thank you for being a beacon for us, for giving us a space and the opportunity to really come together and to be in this moment. You started off so accurately by painting the fact that this typically happens at the Apollo. And while we're not together in person, there is a sweetness to this being live and happening together from my living room to yours, wherever that may be. The opportunity to be in community is about showing up for each other. And regardless of whether you're watching this on Zoom or YouTube or beside your child who's performing tonight, we're in community and we are together. And I was thinking about what makes this moment possible. And it's the performers, the MC, this Climate Museum team, all of the supporters who have donated their time, their energy, their insights, their friendship. And I'd like to actually give an offering. Um, tonight has felt already so nourishing and so righteous the rage of these young folks and the way that they channel it into something beautiful and poignant and powerful. And what it reminds me of is a poem that has changed my own life from Pat Parker to Audre Lorde. Um, Pat Parker is an amazing black lesbian feminist poet. Uh, Audre Lorde is like the queen mother of social justice in my opinion. And in the seventies and eighties, they wrote to each other. So the poem I'm going to share is a short poem called Legacy. And it is a talisman between Audre Lorde and Pat Parker, a message to stay strong in the fight, to stay clear in these unprecedented times. I give you a legacy of doers, of people who take risk to chisel the crack wider, take the strength that you may wage a long battle, take the pride that you can, never stand small, Take the rage that you can and never settle for less. And I invite that for all of us, but especially to those of you who are speaking tonight. Let your rage become a light on your path. We're so happy that we get to have your brilliance and I cannot wait to see the near future that we build together. Thank you again, Miranda, for having this space tonight. It's really been an honor to stop by and say hello and get this kind of soul affirming nourishment that this is offered this evening. Thank you, Sloan. And Darian, without further ado, I'm passing it back to you. All right, all right, all right. And we are back. Uh, we are at the halfway mark. We got four more uh, speakers. So everybody, let's keep the steam up. So everybody, if we can run in place, we're running in place, running in place, running in place. And we're raising the roof. We're raising the roof for Cree. Cree is in the building. Hi, I'm Cree Gavin Dubois, and today I'll be presenting my poem, Deserving Earth. The earth is suffering, for her heart is heavy. She mourns for her dying children, for people struggle to eat, to breathe, to sleep. All of this is happening while big brand corporations grow into sprawling monsters. Trees and grasslands cut for cattle fade into destruction until they're sedated by the methane of dairy farms. And in their dying breath, exhale carbon dioxide and their will to live. Fossil fuel giants spread dark dust in the earth's pink lungs. Baby ducklings crawl from black ponds. Metallic emissions coat the leaves as a result of the many luxuries we think we need. Put out the earth. What does she deserve? A vibrant earth withers, her animal population declining as we punish her for existing, forever expanding into her layers. Habitats burned because they exist in the wrong place. Oceans bleached because they exist too close to man. Species vanish because they exist in the wrong forest. They just try to live their lives, 
while these large companies emit record high amounts of carbon dioxide, making it harder for others to survive. Yet no one asks why. Hurricanes rage as temperatures rise. She asks, can you help me? Can you save my children? What we deserve to have only matters if the earth gets what she needs to survive. Quarantined, we finally see that when we all work together as a community, we can help prevent any problem from getting worse. Every small step, multiplied by seven billion, truly makes a difference. Bubbling below the surface, beneath dead zones in a blazing sea, a vision of the earth. She says we have a chance to live in an unstrangled world with bountiful seaweed and oxygen for all. We only have one home. Please, let's try to help it. As sea levels rise, our community is directly affected. The air is getting thicker and hard, harder to breathe. My family, we're dying. Help, please help. I want to safeguard the earth, yet it strikes me back with his cries for reasons I can't explain. She cries back at us in sorrow. I'm sorry, she says. I'm trying my best. We must protect the earth so that she will protect us. Thank you. That's right, Cree, and everybody wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. No, seriously, wash your hands is very important. And shake it out, 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 and raise the roof, raise the roof for that piece. Yes. Check it. Every small step multiplied by 7 billion truly makes a difference. Speak on it, say word. That's what I'm talking about. Spirit fingers one more time for Cree and keep them wiggling as we give it up for Josie. Hi, I'm Josie and I'll be reading uh, We the Children. We the children call her Mother Earth because she is the one who helped us begin. We quickly rose out of her hands. We grew so high, she couldn't reach us. The skyscrapers carried us to the heavens. Then, somehow, she shrank to our eyes. Was it because of how high up we were? Or was it because we sickened her, shrunk her down into a shriveled, crisp gray potato, burning and steaming? She has no hospital, only us. And we have failed her. Oh, mother, forgive us. We heard about the dinosaurs. We didn't want to be extinct. We wanted to survive. We thought it would get better. We thought you would get better. Don't let us die. After all we have built, how could you let us die? We're dying now. You ran your blood through with chemicals, thinking they were gifts, not poison. At least it wasn't premeditated, right? We had no quarrels, only instructions. We've always had instructions for you. Since the beginning, when we asked for water and sun and food and air and light and dark, and you gave it to us then. When we asked for energy and speed and power and glory and freedom, you let us find it. Did we take the wrong, did we take the wrong path? Did you lie to us, Mother? We're trying to get better. We're trying to find our way back. We're trying to survive. Oh, yes. You children. Your whining has become a distant droning over the years. I nearly forgot your existence. I am as much a mother to you as the sky is father to you. I owe you nothing. But I must give you credit. No species has ravaged my surface and beneath it like you have. You've used your intelligence and my body to create new toys to play with. Good for you. You hurt me. 
but it is merely a second. You selfish, egotistical creatures believe you are all I think about. I will last longer than you can imagine, which does not get you off the hook. Oh no, you have cast destruction across my forest, terrorized and excommunicated your origins, the birds, the bears, the bees, smog and the garbage you flood my body with will end up choking each and every one of you. Now, only you can change. I cannot fix you. There is a beauty within you that will be hard to replace. Please, try to save yourself. Thank you. Yes, Jose! And everybody, we are grocery shopping, we're grocery shopping, we're grocery shopping, we're grocery shopping, and we are raising the roof for that piece. Check it. Now only you can change. I cannot fix you. There is beauty within you. That is what's up. Speak on it, say word, and let's go and check out the chat. Uh, I, I saw a couple that I wrote down. So uh, Gene S says, boom. I agree. Boom. Charlotte Matthew says, so powerful. Agreed. Inwood, uh, Instant Wood says, epic. And R. Miriam Goldberg says, grateful for the sweetness and spaciousness of being with you tonight. I agree. I'm incredibly grateful as well. So everybody, spirit fingers one more time for Josie and keep them wiggling for our second to last speaker. Give it up for Alma. Those were the good old days. My grandfather's nostalgia for his time seemed so unshakable that I never doubted him. Perhaps you've heard the same speech from your parents lecturing you about how much better times were when they were young. Well, our planet is in its worst condition and it's only derailing from its path to sustainability. But recall a special memory you had somewhere. It's significance in your life and how it has changed you. You can replay the scene a thousand times in your head remembering even the minor details. And years later when you visit, you still feel a connection. For my grandpa, growing up in the lush green landscapes of South Asia, his wild spirit led him to search for bright colored tigers, climb green trees, pleasures that have disappeared today. Many of us will never get to do these things and I'm afraid that this rendition of Tarzan's world is gone. As humans, it's difficult to confront the reality we live in especially when we don't hold total control. As they say, ignorance is bliss, but I'm here to tell you that everyone has a part in this global catastrophe and the future is as close as tomorrow. But recall a special memory you had somewhere. Uh, when I was 13, I remember the silent despairing night that followed after an entirety of festivities, running with cousins, listening to grandpa's stories, eavesdropping on the auntie's gossip, eating fried rice topped with spicy kebabs, which caused me to drink lots of water. In the hours that followed, my father had managed to give his farewells and gifts, parting ways with his 10 siblings. Even after a long day of guests, none of us could sleep that night. What should have been a casual night of watching television quickly transformed into a nightmare as the words blaring news flared throughout the room. I couldn't take my eyes off the screen, the murky dark water that seemed to devour everything in its path. For once I saw a different side of my grandfather, one that couldn't keep his cool or provide strength to others. Through his words, Instead, he shook uncontrollably. He muttered quietly and, cri and cried. We began receiving calls from relatives, crying in anguish and wishing for answers in uncertainty. Needless to say, it was quite moving to see someone with so much authority so, so shaken. A third of Bangladesh was underwater, which meant thousands of homes were being washed away, families displaced, and livelihoods destroyed. We would learn that the village from my father's side of the family, which had also housed his ancestors, was flooded. It had only been a year earlier when I last saw the courtyard bustling with livestock, the pond filled with colorful fish, and the clay house lined with ripe coconut and jackfruit trees. The worst of all was that I felt solace and relief in my New York City apartment because the disaster had occurred thousands of miles away. About 41 million people were affected in a country that produced the least amount of emissions worldwide. 
and yet suffered due to the effects of climate change at the expense of other countries. For all my life, I had lived sheltered in, under the relative safety that New York provided, besides the occasional flooding in subway tunnels or leaking sewer pipes. There was nothing that could surmount to the monsoons that were ravaging the Eastern Hemisphere. My parents had taught me to be compassionate and empathetic towards others, yet I failed to share their feelings and thought of my own. The government does not remind us of the struggles that countries are facing unless it concerns their national interests. This shouldn't be a political ploy um, where leaders wait to intervene at the most perilous time. There's a moral argument that millions of lives are at stake, but also the bigger picture. Our damage is irreversible. There will be an avalanche of effects across the globe, as surging refugees, severe business ties, and an unbalanced ecosystem and more. In the weeks after, my family sent aid in every way they could, mail, messenger, nonprofits, organizations. Grandpa would travel to Bangladesh to stay there for six months, building mosques in honor of his ancestors and restoring villages. He always had an undying love for nature and people. After all, he had been the spiritual healer for his village. His mind was an encyclopedia for herbal medicines. Both him, him and father saw beauty in their country, a diamond in the rough. My father soon began investing in apartment flats and reconstructing buildings in his hometown. It'll all be gone by 2050, I would say. I knew more disasters were waiting to come and I didn't understand how much more he wanted underwater. But yet he stayed hopeful, envisioning a future where my siblings and I would inherit and continue his, inherit his properties and continue his efforts. While I was all too aware of Bangladesh's doomed fate, um, many officials still accept, still refuse to accept the continuous cycle that of climate change, which is resulting in higher tides, heavier floods, longer droughts, which is further sinking communities into poverty. And this problem will not only be present in third world countries, but rising tides will also swallow up cities and sweep away homes across the globe. If my family is willing to rebuild their homes on a sinking landmass, then our leaders must be willing to rethink their environmental goals and consider the future they're leaving behind for my generation. Until then, we have a choice to save Mother Nature or face her wrath, which won't discriminate. Thank you. Boom! As Jean has said, and everybody hypnotized, hypnotized, hypnotized. We are hypnotized by these amazing words and raise the roof, raise the roof for that essay. Check it. Everyone has a part in this global catastrophe. That is what's up. Thank you so much for those words. Everybody, one more time, spirit fingers for Ama and spirit fingers for our last speaker of the night. Give it up for Purple! My name is Purva and I will be performing Flickering Memories. Fourth grade, the year of the fireflies. When night crept upon the hot summer day, I would leap up to venture outdoors into the mysterious world enveloped in silhouettes. The dispellers of dark were these living bulbs of light that illuminated my excitement with a glow of unmistakable radiance. Then they cunningly vanished just as my sister and I went to cup our fingers about their papery wings. Even when exhaustion went out against my enthusiasm, the fireflies would etch out ignited mazes on my eyelids flickering in my dreams. That year, I wrote an acrostic. The words spilled out of me onto a crease page with doodles at the flaps and multiplication practice on the back. F, fly with bright lights. I, it is a beautiful sight. R, riding with the wind. E, easy catching. F, Finding with your eyes. Oh, light the dark night. I, it is the best thing in nature. E, everywhere in the sky. S, shining so bright. Fireflies, my first poem. But then the fireflies seem to dwindle. I want to relive those beautiful nights when the air is sticky with saccharine heat. Yet when I hurry outside, all I see is one feeble flicker here, another faint one there. Where were the rest? Where? A mournful silence is the only response that rustles in the wind. Flapping wings and flares of light dwindle from my memory, merging with my distant thoughts. Thoughts that sizzle in the wounds of my nostalgia. This is 
false promises and shattered dreams of a world that is crumbling each time we draw breath. It is about the very existence that slips through our coarse hands, calloused with hollow greed and green bills, slips away before we could ever cradle it back to life. Even our artificial bulbs and fluorescent streetlights hold the truth behind these silent stories of loss. Imagine the scale of this apocalypse that we have trapped our planet in, where the flick of a switch is enough to smolder our past recollections and steal away the experiences of our children as we rock our wounded past back and forth, desperate to find calm in the sea of broken jars. Bottled stories spill out of us in tales of sorrow and regret. The same glass jars that used to catch mystical creatures of light now encase our guilt till the grief threatens to explode from within. So when the moment comes to recount the past to our children, what can we even tell them? That we simply failed? As we clear our throats to reminisce on those pale, flaky memories, fraying cords we aim to sew back together in vain, it almost feels as if those days were a fairy tale. Days when dizzy laughter was the language of summer nights. Days before reality or industry, commercial corporation or palm plantation could ever find their way into my dialect of fragmented English woven into a Telugu mother tongue. Because looking back on the past is like dreaming. Each moment we cling at this ignorance brings us closer to a future where fireflies only belong in the depths of our imaginations. But before darkness swallows truth, we can let our stories intermingle and bring back the twinkling lights of yesterday one firefly at a time. I know it won't be easy to uncap the jars that bought, gather dust in the attics of our past and let loose the emotions that are struggling in a ceaseless battle within us. But this is a choice that you and I can make, lest our love of life ebb to a distant story we tell our children with a note of lingering heartache. Thank you. Yes! Mic drop! And everybody, dirt off your shoulders, dirt off your shoulders, dirt off your shoulders, dirt off your shoulders, and raise the roof for that piece. Woo! This is a choice that you and I can make. That is what's up. Say words, spirit fingers, everybody, one more time for Perva. And citizens of the world, that, that are, that's all of our speakers for tonight. Ah! But listen, we are not done. No, no, no. First of all, raise the roof, everybody. Raise the roof for all of our speakers. But hold up, we are not done, okay? So now we need to take all of this amazing energy that these young people have given us and we need to harness it for some collective action. Remember I mentioned that before, collective action is the name of the game. So I'm gonna hand it over to Miranda to tell us what is necessary and what you, what you need to do next, Miranda. Thank you, Darian. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Climate Speaks performers. All of that energy, all of that power that we all just experienced, we need to use it to move forward together. I said earlier, the climate crisis is an intergenerational justice crisis, and that's true. And we need to accept and follow the leadership of young people like the young people who've spoken out tonight. But we can't be passive, those of us who are not young. We have to be leaders too. And what we're asking you to do with the power that we hope you've been able to recognize in yourselves tonight, because our performers recognize their own power and they used it ambitiously and wisely to move you. And we're asking you to do the same thing. Go to our website, which is climatemuseum.org and become a climate ambassador. <laughs> Start talking about climate to the people in your life. That might seem like a trivial thing, but experts say it's one of the most important civic actions that we can take on the climate crisis. And the reason is pretty simple. 
the large majority of us are walking around, 57% of us in the US, walking around freaked out about the climate crisis, but also shut down. Why? Because we're outscaled. We feel the enormity of a global crisis bearing down upon us, it's larger than any one of us, and we need to know that we're part of a community of action. That's what our work is all about. That's what tonight is all about. And that's what our new Climate Ambassador Program launching today is all about. If you go to our website, you'll be able to print out a Climate Ambassador card. There are resources on the website that will give you backup and information about how to have those initial conversations. It's harder than it might sound to some people and the most critical first step you can take. Tomorrow, in addition to launching our YouTube channel, being forced online has been a huge gift. You've just seen part of that gift. Um, and it's also meant that we've been put in the position of creating a bunch of videos that we wanna share with the world. So we're launching our YouTube channel tomorrow. We're also launching the Climate Ambassador feedback loop so that you can share your stories of spreading the word about climate, spreading your own true feelings about climate with the people you know and love who know and love and respect you. Please visit our website. We wish there were 5,000 climate museums. We wish we didn't have such an easy to remember website, but it really is just climatemuseum.org. And if you go there right now, you'll be able to join our program of becoming a climate ambassador and also really importantly to join us in lifting up the voices of young people. So let me ask you to put your spirit fingers in the air for all the wonderful people we heard from tonight. And with that, Darian, let me ask you to close us out. Yes, yes, and there it is folks. You know what to do, you know what you have to do. Now we're gonna close out because we gotta do one more roll call to all of our amazing, amazing speakers. So everybody get ready to warm up your arms because we're about to raise the roof for a good while. All right, here we go. Everybody raise the roof, raise the roof for Brianna. Break the climate silence. And everybody raise the roof, raise the roof for Andreas. Break the climate silence. And raise the roof, everybody, for Chayunika. Break the climate silence. And everybody raise the roof for Michelle. Break the climate silence. And everybody raise the roof for Cree. Break the climate silence. And everybody raise the roof for Jose. Break the climate silence. And everybody raise the roof for Ama. Break the climate silence. And everybody raise the roof for Perva. Break the climate silence. Yes, yes, break the climate silence. Break the climate silence. Break the climate silence. And everybody, that is our show. Be sure to join us tomorrow. Same time, same bat channel, whole new lineup. Let's go out and let's save the world. Stay strong, stay safe, stay loud. Stand tall, one love, peace.